In this next session, you'll see Gwen Adshead being interviewed by Steve Anksel. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Gwen Adshead. So now on the Literary Festival, serial homicide, stalking, arson, gang crime. Who are the people behind these acts of violence? What are their stories? And what's it like to sit in the same room with them? Well, Dr Gwen Adshead is one of Britain's leading forensic psychiatrists and has spent 30 years providing therapy inside secure hospitals and prisons. Whatever her patients' crime, she helps them to better know their minds by enabling them to articulate their life experiences. The Devil You Know challenges what we think we know about evil and has the power to change minds. Welcome to the I Like Literary Festival then, Dr Gwen, and uh, the book, The Devil You Know. Let's start with, where does the title come from? Oh, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, so the, de- the, the title of The Devil You Know really came about from a discussion with me and my co-author Eileen Horn. And as you can imagine, choosing a title for a book like this was quite complicated. Um, but we, the, the real purpose of the book is to help people take another look at perhaps the, the, the kinds of offenders and offences that we perhaps very naturally shy away from. And the premise of the book, in a way, is that it's better to know our devils than to avoid them. And that actually the better we know them, the better we may be able to understand them and maybe prevent violence happening in the future. So the devil you know, um, of course, the proverb, the devil you know is better than the one you don't, really we thought was a really nice lead into a really nice description of what we were trying to do with the book. Yes, it very much does so. And uh, your introduction is quite um, revealing, I think, in a way. Um, I mean, looking at some of the details uh, mental health, for example. Um, 70% of people in UK prisons today are mes- estimated to have at least two mental health issues, uh, ranging from depression to substance misuse and addiction or psychosis. Uh, that's pretty high, isn't it? It is, and it's dramatically higher than in the general population. And that's a cause of real concern, I think, because our prisons are not built and are not staffed to hold lots of people with mental disorders, um, nor to, of course, to treat them. Um, So if you think about uh, a little bit of penal history, you know, when prisons were first built, they were built really to contain mainly debtors. um, And of course, we had capital punishment for violent offenders. But now uh, we still imprison lots of debtors. um, But now we're having an ever increasing proportion of people of, of violent offenders and their sentences are getting longer. So we are holding people for substantial periods of their life and prison can be extremely stressful for a place for people to live in Um, and this is an important thing for us to think about because we may also put into prison some very vulnerable people so in a way we're making a bit of a rod for our own backs um, by putting people in prison who probably need to be in psychiatric hospitals. Yes very much so. Um, So how did you end up becoming a forensic psychiatrist and and indeed psychologist well um i trained as a doctor and i all and i knew pretty much straight off the bat that i wanted to do psychiatry because although there were lots of other bits of medicine that appealed to me when i came to work with in mental health or in psychiatry then um i really found it very intellectually appealing and i felt that i had a connection to the work so um, um i wanted to do psychiatry and then along the way i did a master's degree in medical law and ethics and that got me interested in the relationship between law and health and so that really decided me that I wanted to work in forensic psychiatry which is an area where law and mental health very naturally come together mainly in the criminal law in the criminal courts but not only there also in other branches of the law so I was really interested in how law and psychiatry interact so that was my way into forensic psychiatry but then along the way still further I felt that what I really wanted to do was to work as a psychological therapist. So I would be the one who would be talking to the patients that I was writing about or giving evidence about sometimes. I really wanted to be able to have those kind of conversations so I would get to know people um, in that kind of deep way uh, that psychiatrists really want to know people. So that's why, in addition to my forensic psychiatric training, I also did a training as a kind of psychological therapist. And I'm a, a group therapist by training. 
training, uh, plus I've trained in some other forms of therapy as well. It's a big subject, isn't it? Um, psychiatry, psychology, and forensic as well. Very much so. I mean, the word forensic comes from the Latin word forum, um, and it refers to the place, the public place where citizens' disputes were held. And so the word forensic has come to mean anything to do with the law. Um, but most, most psychiatry is done, um, and most forensic psychiatry is probably most noticeable in the criminal courts, because there, forensic psychiatrists like myself are there to advise the courts on the contribution of people's mental illness to their violence risk, and whether and to what extent, if any, their mental health problems help us to understand why they did what they did and, um, as well and whether they should be held responsible. So they're quite complicated legal and philosophical questions that get asked in the criminal court. And that's another reason why forensic psychiatry is really interesting, because I think those are the kinds of issues that most people think are of interest. A lot of people say, well, uh, OK, that person did that horrible thing, but they were mentally ill at the time. Maybe we shouldn't hold them quite as responsible as somebody who, did, who didn't who did have a mental illness. So a lot of people are interested in these kinds of questions, which is another reason why I like forensic psychiatry. But you've been doing it for such a long time, but you know, mental health is really very much in the news, especially with the pandemic, uh, you know, and people being shut up at home, effectively, imprisoned almost in some cases, especially if you live in an apartment uh, with no balcony and, and shut inside. I mean, that must be, you know, quite a, quite a lot more uh, uh, mental health issues in that way. Well, there are certainly reports of that, and it's currently being researched, I think. Um, certainly, we know that people, some people in lockdown have experienced very high levels of stress. And that has led to, I think, in some situations, has led to family tensions. Um, in, some te in some cases, it's led to increased experiences of domestic violence. So there are increased perpetrators of domestic violence. Um, and we wait to see really what the long term impact of the pandemic will be, both on mental health in the short term, but also in the longer term. I think we're still waiting to see exactly how bad it might be. Well, the book uh, covers, uh, the, as I say, the introduction, but also you cover ca test cases uh, in, in a way, both men and women, um, although 5% of offender population is female and 25% uh, are of ethnic uh, backgrounds. That's interesting, but I, I love your quotations. Right throughout the book, you, you have quite a few quotations and a bit of Latin. It's from Jacques Cousteau, of all people, mm. the, the famous uh, diver uh, from France and uh, the television um, documentary maker. Uh, he said, the best way to observe a fish is to become a fish. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful quote. And again, one of the great advantages of working with a co-author is that you have two of you to go looking for beautiful quotes. And um, and Eileen found that one. And the reason it was particularly appealing for us was really for two reasons. One, because um, I find that the best one of the best metaphors for the human mind is that of an ocean, so that what's going on on the surface is often is not the same as what's going on deep. And if you really want to understand a person's mind and how they function as a person you have to go deep and you often have to go into the dark uh, you don't necessarily know what's there and neither do they um, so there's something about the metaphor of the ocean which is a really good metaphor for the human mind and that na very naturally led us to thinking about Jacques Cousteau and those explorations underwater and that idea that we might try and look for things in common so throughout the book, we talk about the notion of radical empathy, a kind of compassion where we get up close to people to try and understand what's going on for them, trying to really understand them as a person, a person like myself, but also keep a kind of distance as well. So we're, we're, we're going deep to the roots of things, which is the word radical comes from, um, but we're also keeping a pretty safe distance. But we're going into the environment where people will be. We're going into the prisons and we're going into those, those secure psychiatric hospitals where we're going to meet these people and uh, we're going to hear their stories and try and get to know them as people. Uh, you also touch on philosophy a little bit as well. Uh, I think you touched on that. And uh, there is a philosophical quote in here from uh, Carl Jung, actually, uh, that thinking is hard. That's why most people judge. Yes. Uh, yes. That's a very good quote, isn't it? 
It really is. And um, and when we and I think what Jung was getting at, too, was is that when people don't know what to make of something, where they feel puzzled or uncertain or even anxious, it's easier to do a kind of black and white categorization, right, wrong, you know, sort of you no know, good, bad. It's much easier to do those kind of things and to stay with uncertainty. But one of the things that I've learned uh, from working as a psychological therapist is how important it is for us as people to become a bit more comfortable with being uncertain, to say it's okay not to know what to think or what to feel or what to do. Sometimes it's really important just to stay with the uncertainty or ambiguity of something and see how it pans out and so I think that Jung is saying something very important again about the complexity of the human mind um, it's not as simple the, uh, our minds are not simple oh no <laughs> yeah. that's for sure that's for sure okay well look at the end of the introduction before we actually get into the meat of the book as, as it were uh, you've got some meanings and I think they're quite important to point out uh, because uh, as you say prejudice plays a lot in terms of most common people uh, thinking about uh, prisoners and, and offenders. Uh, that's a particular word. The word offender uh, and the word normal and, and indeed the word privilege um, have more than one sense. Yes, no, that's right. Um, and uh, I mean... Offender is a term of art in a sense, um, and it's in, in the in the terms of this book, it merely means somebody who's been convicted of a criminal offence, and it's just a really easy term to refer to people who've been convicted. Um, not everyone who's convicted of a criminal offence will necessarily be in prison, of course, um, and so you can be convicted of multiple offences and still be at large in society. But we're really talking about people who've broken the criminal law when we talk about offenders. So. This is not just people giving offence. It's actually people who've broken the criminal law. Um, and then when it comes to uh, what was what was the second one? The, Pri privilege. The, the, privilege. Pr privilege. Mm. Well, the thing about privilege is that um, is that privilege, again, it is a privilege in the terms of a special kind of knowledge. Um, but again, this comes from the Latin, which is a sort of private or secret reading. So the and in the USA, they actually talk about legal privilege. So we were very keen to get across to people that it is a privilege to hear from people about their personal histories. And it is my job. It is my ethical and legal duty to treat those stories with respect, not only for the offenders, but also in relation to their victims who might be affected by disclosure. And it's in that context that we created kind of composite pictures, which are clinically real, but they're based on multiple, multiple different people. Um, so each case is not an actual person, but a composite of the many, many people I've seen or assessed or discussed over the years. Um, and that's really to be respectful um, of the privilege of hearing these, this kind of very delicate and powerful and tragic material uh, from people who've done terrible things. Yes, um, maybe I should quote from your book, if I may. <laughs> uh, Please do. It's a true privilege to bear witness to people taking risks in order to share what Shakespeare called our naked frailties. And we are respectful of that, which is what you said. And the secondly, the privilege is a vital medico-legal concept, meaning that patient information and conversations with them should be kept for private knowledge, which I'm sure you sure you do. And boy, what private knowledge you've got! <laughs> well, and I mean, it, it's it's one of the questions that I'm frequently asked, which is, of course, about about confidentiality and the ethical and legal duties of confidentiality. And I respect those duties; they are very important to me. But I did also know from talking with patients and, and prisoners over the years that I think they do, they are keen for people to try and understand them better. I mean, they, they usually remember a time when they were not prisoners or patients. And, and I think that there is a kind of benefit potentially to trying to help the general public understand um, people who've committed violence a little bit better. So in the spirit of that kind of inquiry or a spirit of a kind of invitation to come and see the world that I work in, that's why um, Eileen and I decided to create composites. And it's also in the spirit of great medical writers like Oliver Sacks, for example, who also created composites um, and um, other therapists like Susie Orbach, um, people who, you know, where we create 
clinically accurate uh, composites based on the people that we've seen. Well, it was a BBC or book of the week uh, on Radio 4, and uh, it gets some great credits uh, from Val McDermott, exceptional, and Sebastian Fawkes, extraordinary. So you've got um, you know a few good readers here uh, uh, of the book. I know. It's fun, you know, the lovely, lovely feedback from these wonderful writers. It's, I'm sure you can imagine, or I'm sure you know from your own work, when you, when you work really hard at something, and um, it's incredibly exciting um, and pleasing to get this kind of very positive feedback because it means that you know we we have it looks as though we have at least for some people at least been able to communicate this kind of interest and and radical empathy that we wanted to share with and explore with other people right well the book has quite a few uh, case histories and case studies i think i'm sure the names aren't quite correct but <laughs> um i know that your first task uh, when you were a rookie almost uh, and in uh, given uh, the first patient who was a serial killer uh, yes. which is quite a serious stepping in and you weren't given anyone gentle like you know a, you know, a shoplifter or something like that you know you were given the serial murderer and his name was uh, Tony in the book um, do you want to tell us about that? Yes. I mean, I, I, it was very when when Eileen and I were putting the book together, we wanted to use examples for lots of different types of, offen of, of offender. And although serial killers are incredibly rare, incredibly rare, particularly in the UK, um, nevertheless, we were, you know, we're only too aware that there would be, you know, there would be an interest in people who killed sequentially. So we had to be very thoughtful about this because, of course, you know, because there are so few serial killers, um, it would be only too easy to identify them. So, um, so Tony's case is based on uh, many, several cases that I've been involved with, either directly or indirectly. And I guess one of the things that's really interesting about people who kill repeatedly. Um, over time is that uh, is, is interesting. one of the things that I didn't really fully understand until we indeed we were writing this is that there is there been some general international agreement on the number of killings you have to do to make you a serial killer and the number is three um, which seemed to me to be a rather bizarre uh, number um, has slightly arbitrary quality to it um, but nevertheless the number uh, is three um, and in this country uh, as I'm sure people can go away and Google there really haven't been very many people um, who've killed more than three people um, but there have been a few a few people who've killed about three or maybe three or four um, and they often don't come to a lot of attention particularly if their victims are male and that was another reason why I thought it was important to write something about a serial killer whose victims are male because there's a tendency to assume that all serial killers you know stalk and kill you know beautiful young women and actually that's probably not the that's probably not necessarily the majority um, and certainly not in the UK anyway um, so in this particular case story what we're what we're introducing really is is not only as you say me very much as a rookie learning how to do my craft as a therapist with someone who's done something you know very unusual and scary um, but also how somebody might change their mind over time and what and the process of how we try and help people just say more and more about their minds and the more we can get people to say about their minds the more we can really try and get to the heart of perhaps of what motivated them to 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 commit their offense and in this particular case what motivated them to to kill and having once killed, what could have motivated them to kill again? So that's really the purpose of the therapy, is partly to help the person understand themselves better, but also to help us, the professionals, understand their violence risk better. So it has a kind of dual purpose to it, and that's where the craft comes in. And that's why people like me need to be spending lots and lots of hours, um, uh, and obviously in the early days, and still to some extent now, you know, having supervision from senior colleagues, just to make sense of what we're hearing. How, how do you um, get a rapport going with uh, an offender? Um, because, as you say, most of them are, in, in this case, Tony was pretty... 
uh, mentally unstable and also gay um, in that way. So, uh, and his his victims uh, were, were 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 men. Um, yeah. How do you get establish rapport? And when you went in for that first time and you sat down on a chair, um, how do you how do you get a rapport going? I mean, it's something that interviewers do, but uh, you know, for you to sit down in a prison or in a locked room with knowing that person is a serial killer, um, you have to establish a rapport. And I guess it takes a long time. Well, it depends a little bit on the context, because obviously if that person has asked to see a therapist, then that's half, you know, that's half the job done. You know that this person is at least, you know, uh, at some level willing to meet with you. And the other thing it's really important to bear in mind is uh, that uh, just like other interviewers, uh, we're reasonably certain that this person isn't going to leap up and attack us. <laughs> um, and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's most violence is very contextual and relational and there there isn't and and people who've killed once even if they've killed serially you know are not necessarily in a homicidal state of mind at all times that sometimes they just sit down and read the paper or you know watch tv or you know play pool or you know do the crossword or whatever happens you know they're not always in a homicidal frame of mind and and so there's no particular reason to be frightened um or anxious um, but of course, people are, you know, as always at all first meetings, people are a bit shy and a bit stiff. And that goes for the therapist, too, as well as the patient. So often what I do to try and establish a rapport is um, a to introduce myself, obviously, and to explain what I'm doing there and perhaps more particularly what I'm not doing. Um, so I'm obviously explaining to people that I'm not there to say that they're mad or get them to confess to things, that I'm, I'm there because I understand that they're interested in having some time to talk in therapy with someone like me. I help them to under, I try and help them to understand that I'm used to doing this. Um, this was a bit harder when I was junior, but you know, that I'm used to doing this, that I'm not going to be uh, distressed or embarrassed or ashamed or upset if they tell me things that are distressing. And, um, and that I'm genuinely interested in how we come to be meeting today. And so often I find myself saying, you know, where does this story start? How, do, how is it that we come to be sitting down meeting here like this today? And that kind of question, a very open kind of question, often allows people to, to start where A, it helps them to start where they want to. Um, because one of the most important things, as again, as, as a good interviewer, you know this, one of the most important things is to avoid any sense of an interrogation. <laughs> and, okay, and of course, I'm not interested necessarily in asking people and getting things out of them. What I'm really interested is in them telling me things because they feel comfortable enough to tell me things and that that their faith that we are on the same page when it comes to sharing a conversation. So a lot of the early stages are about establishing a kind of trust and a kind of alliance um, and the and what's interesting about this is that research um, on the outcomes of psychological therapy show that one of the things that really determines whether your therapy will be effective or not is whether you've got a good therapeutic alliance. So I spend a lot of time at the beginning of my work establishing a kind of um, being the kind of person that you could feel comfortable with saying things that are a bit unusual or a bit odd. Uh, and of course, you have to establish that rapport uh, with that person uh, and they then have to have the confidence to actually tell you these things, uh, and, you know, and some of which they haven't even told their mother uh, or, or, or the closest person. So, you know, you, you, you have a big responsibility there, of course. Uh, but haven't they, haven't they when you said that uh, they've asked for psychiatric help, uh, have they not already taken that big step and you're helping it, them indeed and so i mean you know that as, as always that's the first step to become aware that there really is a problem and perhaps always to be curious about it um and one of the things in places you know in secure psychiatric hospitals or in prisons most offenders know that at some point they're going to have to think about what they did and why they did it you know, they know that somebody, perhaps somebody at a parole hearing um, or maybe at some, or some other kind of related legal forum, somebody's, somebody who's, who's 
you know, who's got decisions to make about the, their future, will ask them, well, what do you think about what, what you did and why you did it? So they know that at some point they're going to have to think about it. So if they're, if they're coming at all, actually, you know, from my point of view, so long as they're turning up, that's the most important thing. Now, anybody can have an off day and sometimes people turn up and they don't feel like talking or they feel a bit anxious. And of course, it can take time to establish a kind of conversational rapport. But I, I'm used to that. So I'm not worried. I'm not worried if we have, a, you know, quite a few false starts. Sometimes people might only stay 20 minutes and then say, I think I've had enough for today. And it's like, okay. You know, and then we'll see you see you next week. And it can it can easily take, you know, six months, sometimes even a year to establish that kind of alliance because you know, you need to build up trust, but you know, you mentioned they haven't even told their mother. Well, of course, these are people who may not have had a mother. Um, or they may never have had anybody that they felt able to trust. Or that the person the people that they did trust were the people that they most had to fear. So, so, so actually, that's another reason why establishing trust can be really, really tricky. Well, you obviously have to be a very good listener, that's for sure. Well, I, th I think there's, a, and there's different kinds of listening too. I think that's what I've had to learn over the years. There's listening out for what's on the surface, um, the, and the way that people speak and their their volume, and and also listening, are they making eye contact? Those kind of listening things. Um, but I think there's also listening out for what's not said, listening out for the gaps in speech, listening out for the pauses, listening out for when people change the topic or don't finish a sentence. And I was fortunate enough to do some training, which really helped me uh, to listen out much more carefully for quite subtle incoherences or confusions in speech. Um, which often were quite revealing about people's mental states, um, particularly if they were talking about something painful or difficult like a bereavement um, or abuse or trauma or something or the offence itself. Um, so listening out for the ways that people talk as well as the content of what they say has turned out to be really important for me as a forensic psychotherapist. Yes, very much so. And of course, you know, the words that people use can be misinterpreted or yeah, misconstrued even, it's certainly misunderstood. Well, indeed. And quite often people use a word that comes to mind, but they don't really necessarily mean that word. Um, and so sometimes it's really important just to explore what they mean by that word. One of the things that I also look out for a lot are the kinds of metaphors that people use, because metaphors in human beings are often used to convey emotions. Um, and so the metaphors that people use are often very powerful ways to convey not a, a, a strong emotions, but also some emotions about relationships. So um, I'm often listening out for the metaphors that people use um, and the way that they and the way that they use language. So, I mean, I think it's very important. This is what I mean about not sticking on the surface, but always going deep. So um, the fact that somebody might sound a bit rude or sound a bit dismissing or say something that might sound it might sound initially to my ear a bit offensive or a bit prickly. I, it's incredibly important that I don't go with my first reaction, which is to feel maybe a bit offended or a bit startled and just try and work out and you know, just hold myself in uncertainty and just saying what what's going on for you when you use that word why did you what was what were you trying to convey to me then um, and that's really important it also shows people that you're listening you don't actually have a tape recorder you just write notes afterwards about some key words and key phrases which you've heard that's that's pretty impressive yes. that's impressive well, you have to learn how to do it, and most psychological therapists do learn how to do it. Um, this is partly this is partly because, uh, I mean, traditionally in psychological therapy, no therapist has ever taken a tape recorder in. It hasn't really been part of the tradition, and and but partly because, you know, you're worried that it might put people off speaking. But on a practical note, in my world, um, I'm not allowed to bring tape recorders in because it's secure. These are secure environments, um, and again, these are privileged types of materials that people are talking about, so I'm not allowed to record them. So again, one of the things that I and other forensic therapists have to teach ourselves, we teach ourselves 
to to try and memorize um and like anything we get easier with practice and you try and memorize the first five or ten minutes what this person led with if you like and the last five or ten minutes how it ended and then in the middle you're trying to remember as you say key metaphors or themes or memories or dreams or what what seemed to be the main theme what do they seriously what do they seem to want to get across to me uh today what was the main sort of um leitmotif for want of a better word Mm -hmm. um uh, and those kind of musical metaphors i think are quite sometimes quite helpful um to think to think about and were there any themes that this person kept coming back to um that are going to be important for me to note down because then Um, What I do is that I'm going to use that when I come back, maybe when I come back next week or maybe in 10 weeks time. And I'm going to say, well, you know, I'm remembering a time when you talked about this. And that is very um, affirming to people to know that you've been listening. Hmm. Um, And people say, you know, oh, I remember when I, yeah, yeah, I remember I did say that to you. say, How do you remember that? And I say, well, you know, it it made an impression on me because of this, this and this, because actually it helped me to understand this about you, or it made me wonder this about you. And that's often a good way, that sense of asking people, you know, I'm really interested and curious about your mind. Can you be interested and curious about your mind too? You you mentioned about uh, the prisoner, the offender, um, wants to have some help. Um, But uh, quite a few of these uh, prisoners are in prison and sometimes locked up for 20, 23 hours a day. I know in places like Wandsworth, you know, the, the, the Victorian place there they get locked up for any reason so sometimes they just want to get a reason to get out of the cell Uh, so how do you differentiate between those people who are just trying to do it to get out of being the cell and actually wanting real help i know at broadmoor that makes a big difference because they're already there and and well about to say i mean broadmoor is 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 a is an nhs hospital and and um you get sent to broadmoor people are admitted there under the mental health act for treatment and so all the patients that are there are in some sense seeking treatment or although they can sometimes have mixed feelings about it and it can and 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 well only because it can be painful therapy can be painful it can make you look at parts of yourself and your past that you'd rather not look at so therapy be going to be quite uncomfortable sometimes so you know we're we're used to people being a bit ambivalent about that but in prison you're right there's a range of motivations for seeking therapy and it's one of my jobs is to try and work out who does really uh, you know have a curiosity about their mind and their offense and wants you know wants to use that curiosity to learn something new and who's just you know really wanting to get out of their cell not that i blame them for that because being locked you know being locked up for 23 hours a day not particularly, you know, and any of us might want, might well do anything to get out of ourselves for, you know, and as you were saying, uh, apropos lockdown, you know, I mean, you know, any of us might do anything to have got out for an hour or so. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't particularly feel a need to judge those people, but the real issue is that we don't have enough resources just to have chats with people. We can really, given that we don't have that many therapists going into prisons, we really have to focus on those people who want to make good use of what we've got to to offer um and uh, so we can't we can't really offer that time to people who are just you know, just coming out and having a chat and just don't don't want to don't want to go deep yeah i guess you know nhs cuts and and, and all, budgets and all things uh, does um psychiatry and fairly low down in the in the budget well i i mean so i think compared to physical health um mental health services do always get resourced less um and that's um particularly so in relation to research which is a big problem because we urgently need quite a bit more research um done in mental health and particularly around the efficacies of different kinds of therapy um so there's there's that aspect. But I think the biggest problem in the last 10 years in particular um, has been the impact of cuts on how NHS trusts work. What 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 listeners may or may not know is that um, because NH all medical services are delivered by trusts, <clears throat> effectively, healthcare has become a business in this country, just like it is in the States. And so NHS trusts will often cut services that they think are uneconomical. And they will also 
endeavor to cut costs wherever possible, use the cheapest method wherever possible. And that means getting rid of expensive staff. But your expensive staff are your trained staff. So one of the worries is that we are not able to offer um, some of the more intensive and expensive, uh, more comprehensive kinds of therapies because trusts won't employ um, highly trained staff who are a bit more expensive. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like in cardiac surgery, um, where many trusts want nurses to do procedures, um, and many nurses are trained to do cardiac procedures, minor cardiac procedures, and that's a good thing. Nobody's criticizing cardiac nurses for doing great work. But there are some kind of things where you want your therapist, you want your doctor, you want your intervener to be highly trained and highly experienced. And actually in mental health, you, we need many more psychiatrists and we need many more highly trained, experienced psychological therapists working on the front line so that people don't wait for years for therapy, which is really an intolerable situation. It certainly is. That's the end of the Radio 4 questioning, by the way. <laughs> let's, go <back> to t- <laughs> let's go back to Tony, because uh, in delving into Tony, and that was your first serial killer um, as the rookie, you actually did manage to find um, and be able to regress back to find out another murder. Wasn't that right? Yes. Well, uh, I mean, in this particular story, what, we're, what we were wanting to bring out is that sometimes when therapy is effective and therapy goes well, it's not at all unusual for people to disclose that they actually did some other offenses that they, that they hadn't ever been caught for. Not usually murder, it has to be said. You know, we, and we had a little bit of artistic license with this one, although not, not not i mean i've i've dealt with cases where this actually happened so it's not um it's not untrue but it's not terribly common um but for the purposes of the book we thought it might be interesting to bring that out but it's not at all unusual for offenders once they get into the process of wanting to understand how they came to let themselves do what they did then it they often find themselves talking about things that they haven't told anybody else, just like you said. Um, and that one of the re- and that's one of the reasons in my work where I I always start my therapy sessions by reminding people that actually if they do tell me about new offences or they tell me uh, that they're do- they're thinking about doing something that would pose a risk to themselves or other people, I'm going to have to do something about that. I don't keep secrets in my work. But I always promise them that I will discuss with them what's going to happen and I won't keep secrets from them. Um, But it's very important, I think, uh, for people to understand that therapists like myself are not – we try very hard to be objective and to take the patient's mental health very seriously but also take their risk to others seriously. So we don't, as it were, privilege their mental health over the risk to others. We try and take both as seriously as as the other. Yes, the, that's a, again, that's a bit of a misconcept, isn't it? You, you know, the, the patient doctor uh, privilege doesn't actually necessarily apply in in certain cases in the law. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have lots of we have lots of law and public policy about this uh, for the very obvious reasons that if somebody were to disclose that they were going to do something awful uh, to an NHS professional, then we have some guidance that says that uh, an NHS professional can disclose that if it would help to prevent serious harm uh, to somebody else, uh, which makes sense. Um, but that doesn't undermine confidentiality altogether. What it just says that if you're going to breach confidentiality, you'd have to have jolly good grounds to do so. Um, but serious threats of serious violence to a named individual individual would absolutely count um, as a kind of serious harm. So it's something like a kind of pretty common sense approach. Um, that, And also, you know, by this time, you know, we're assuming that the patient themselves has quite an interest in trying to be honest about and open about things. And we're really wanting to support that honesty and authenticity um, as part of their recovery. Right. Well, look, uh, Gwen, I'm going to now ask you to actually read a section uh, from from the book because we'd love to hear and we talked all around it and I could talk all day with you because there's so many topics to, to go and cover but we are a bit limited on time I suppose uh, but you'd like to talk about um, Sam is that right yes yes I'd like to if I, uh, um, the 
people often ask me which is my favorite case story and and one of my favorite case stories is Sam and I think it's because Sam's a case that I a kind of case that's very familiar to me as a forensic psychiatrist as well as a therapist so this Sam is a man in his 40s who killed his dad um, when he was mentally unwell um and um when he recovers from his mental illness um he has to face the consequences of what he's done and as part of that um he comes to Bromo hospital for treatment and um he comes to a therapy group that we set up for people who killed a family member when they were mentally ill um and this was based on some wonderful work done by some uh, american colleagues in connecticut that i'd heard about um so what I thought I would read is um, a, a, a couple of pages where Sam is in the homicide group. So he's in our weekly homicide group and he's got to the point where he seems to be able to say something about what happened, which, as you can imagine, is a, is a, in a, it often takes a bit of time for people to get to that point. So after nearly a year, Sam arrived at a point where he no longer referred to his offence as my index, but was able to say, when I killed my dad. It is always quite a moment when someone manages this transition, and I remember well the day it happened. He started by describing the morning of the day of the murder, a cool day in October, a decade earlier. He talked about how he had left the hospital where he had been a patient, and after spending the day with some friends that he had just met on the street, so they were not close friends, he eventually found himself making his way towards his parents' house. When I asked him why he had gone there, he said, I don't know why, I guess it was home. It was late by that time, he said, and he slipped round the back of the house. He saw through the window that his dad was making tea in the kitchen and his mum was in the utility room doing some ironing. He said he stood outside watching for a while, like it was a movie or something. And I pictured him out there in the cold night, observing the domestic scene within. I imagined a view of his parents, Judith and Ralph, ch chatting in dumb show. She perhaps enlisting his help in folding some sheets, him pouring the milk and the tea. I could understand how their homely companionship might seem to Sam as remote and exclusive as anything Hollywood could manufacture. He didn't elaborate on what in particular irked him about the tableau through the window, but he told us he got cold and started to feel angry. He tried the door and found it was open. At that point in his tale, Sam paused to take breath, and we all sat quietly waiting for him to go on, sensing that the next part might be hard for him, and for us. As so often happened in that group, I felt the awesome responsibility of bearing witness to horror. Eventually, after we'd held our silence for a few minutes, I thought he might feel he'd said enough for one day. Nevertheless, I asked, Sam, do you want to say any more? I want to drink, he blurted, abrupt and loud. At first, I thought he was talking about now, but no, he was back in that garden at home, speaking of himself in the historic present. His eyes were unfocused. I need money. I need coke. I'm cold. I'm afraid. The police are after me. I can't see my mum and dad. There's my dad. He's looking at me like I'm the worst thing that's ever happened to him. He's not best pleased. I mean, he looks terrified, and I'm thinking, that's not right. You shouldn't be scared. You should be glad to see me. I'm your son. His speech was accelerating. Everyone in the group sat perfectly still, letting the story flow into the space between us. So Dad saying, Sam, what are you doing here? You're meant to be in hospital. And now I'm thinking, that's not much of a welcome, is it? Hasn't even asked how I'm doing or anything. I'm getting angry and I'm thinking, you know, he's probably the one that called the police on me. And then he says, Sammy, like when I was a teenager that babyish, stupid nickname, Sammy, I think you should go. And I'm thinking, man, that's it. Even my dad hates me now. I didn't take my eyes off Sam, but I heard one of the other patients let out a sort of half gasp, releasing a bubble of tension. 
Sam bent over in his chair, rubbing at his face with his hands. I was filled with a sense of sadness and dread that was almost theatrical, like that feeling of watching Medeo or Macbeth, when you know what's coming, and whisper to yourself, oh no, don't do it. After a bit, one of the patients leant over and said, you okay, mate? Need some water? Sam nodded, and one of my co-therapists got up, went to the water cooler and passed him a cup. He downed it in a gulp. Then he looked up at the ceiling, then at the clock at the wall, which never told the correct time, anywhere but at one of us. I don't think I can say any more right now, he said hoarsely. Tim, one of the other patients, spoke up. You only have to say what you can do, mate. We've all been there. And then another patient, Benny, added, It took me years, man. Don't worry, we know it gets too real. I was touched by their support. And maybe Sam was too, because he was able to continue. So that was it. That's when I killed my dad. I don't remember it all, but I know I started hitting him, grabbed something and started bashing him. And then mum was there screaming at me and I pushed her away and she hit the wall with a sort of cracking sound. And then there was nothing but me hitting my dad. And then no sound. It was like the world fell away. I was frozen there, standing over him, and he was lying there in this puddle of blood. I remember I looked around and thought, this is it. This is the end of everything. Sam dropped his head in his hands then, and I let a pause linger to see if he had anything more to say, but he was silent. Then I looked around the group and asked if anyone had anything they wanted to say to Sam. Nobody spoke. Perhaps the rest is silence, I said. Not all revelation needs a response. And maybe no words matter when someone describes how they have shattered their world. The book is full of uh, this, really, and uh, it's a great read, I have to say, um, Gwen. And, uh, oh, thank you. No, it is very good. And it's, it is very revealing about not only... Um, the legal system and you know the the mental health situation in the country uh, and offenders but also your profession and i think that's very important to come across you know, because uh, your profession is 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 very easy to read here and you can see what you do you're a great listener you have you put in you know a lot of work a lot of time uh, and it, as you say it happens over months not just uh, days it's not instant um, uh, and fascinating too. Uh, I particularly like actually the last one, um, David. Yes. And David is a surgeon. Uh, he's a fellow medical person like yourself, uh, but he's been asked to come to you and obviously comes with a whole bunch of prejudice <laughs> uh, when he comes through the door, um, full of himself. Uh, but you find out that his, his real problem is he's a child pornographer. Um, how do you get to that kind of stage with someone who is obviously highly intelligent um, and not really wanting to be sitting down in a chair opposite you? Well, um, um, the reason that I wanted to write about this is that mm. child pornography is such a terrible problem in our society. It's a multi-million pound industry, and that means that there's multi-millions of people using it. And they can't all be in that we know that they are not all sort of weirdos and loners and misfits and strange people. They have to be. The numbers just tell us that they must be ordinary people like you and me. Um, and I was involved tangentially many years ago, uh, very tangentially, in um, a big police operation, which was picking up people who were using child pornography sites via their credit cards. Um, and um, in that operation, they they picked up quite a lot of doctors um, and I got consulted um, something about what might be going on for these these doctors and and why they might be doing this and um, and that and that memory of that stayed with me a long time and so it made me curious and I thought it was important perhaps for us to get across just how important it is to realize that 
child pornography is something that is accessed and downloaded by nice people like us, not just weirdos, and that we all of us have to be really thoughtful about this. And the other thing is that not everybody who uses child pornography will necessarily go on to be a, a, an actual contact, what's called a contact offender. They won't actually do anything to children. But of course, they're contributing to the industry by looking at it. And I think we as a society have to ask ourselves some really deep and hard questions about why this pornography exists. Why is it that there's a market for this kind of imagery? It's, uh, I say, it's too big to just be the focus of a few loners or strange and unusual people. It's too big for that. Um, so it must be something about a kind of what kind of human cruelty that's perhaps there in all of us that makes people interested in downloading child pornography. And that's really what David's story is about. Mm, well, as I say, they're all fascinating stories amongst themselves. Do you ever deal with children? Have you had, ever had a child in the in opposite you? Uh, no, I don't see children. Um, I, um, I hope people will be reassured to know that there are specialists like myself who do work with child offenders. Um, I'm thankful also to be able to say that the numbers of child offenders are, are, are relatively small um, and the numbers of young people we imprison is getting less, which is good news. Um, but nevertheless, um, having said that, we have quite a number of young men who committed offences when they were you know, perhaps 19, um, so only just into adulthood, um, who've got very long tariffs for murder. Um, and these are young men who will then be growing up in prison. So one of the things we have to think about very carefully is what provision we make for young people who, who are going to be doing a really important part of their growing up in prison. And what kind of people do we want them to be when they eventually come out of prison? So that needs a bit of thinking about too. It certainly does. Well, look, it's it's your first, isn't it? Are you going to it make, is. Are you going to do some more? Because there must be many more stories up there in your head. Well, we're well, we're thinking about it. Eileen and I are going to go away for a week and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. The devil, you know. Um, and the last question I wanted to ask you, um, Gwen, was um, you always start your uh, interview with a. Uh, with a patient, with a with a question that you can't answer yes or no to, which is obviously one of the main things you do, especially with children. Um, what is that question normally? Well, the question is normally, where does the story start? Tell me your story. Where does your story start? And, and wherever they go, wherever they start, that's where we'll go. Very good. Excellent. Nice way to finish. Gwen Adshed, thank you very much. Um, Adshed. The Devil You Know, published by Faber, and a great read. Well worth it. Thank you for talking to us, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know it's a, uh, a remote uh, joining here once again. Uh, sadly, you can't be with us yes. physically in the Isle of Wight, but uh, perhaps next time and the next book. Oh, I really hope so. I'm thrilled to have been asked. I'm really sorry not to be there in person, and I hope the festival goes really well. Thank you very much for participating in the Isle of Wight Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors and supporters who've sustained the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it will be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge.